Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing subgroups. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the subgroups of the group of integers under addition. Okay, and so far what I've done is I've shown you a whole bunch of subgroups of this group of integers under addition. Okay, and this whole bunch of subgroups are of this form a times z, where a is some non-negative integer. Okay, and uh, by a z, what I mean is all integer multiples of this number a, basically. So what you can do is you can pick any non-negative integer for a, basically, and then you can construct the set which consists of all integer multiples of a. So z times a, and you let z vary over all the integers, and that creates you the set consisting of 0, a, negative a, 2a, negative 2a, etc. Okay, and what we've shown now is that for any a as a non-negative integer, this constructs uh, a subset that is actually a subgroup, okay, and that all of these different a's give a distinct subgroup, basically. They give a distinct subset, and therefore a distinct subgroup. Okay, right. So, uh, this is a whole collection, then, of subgroups of the integers under addition. What I now want to prove to you is that, actually, I have completed the list. There are no more subgroups of the integers under addition other than the ones that are included in this list, basically. So I have got you absolutely all of the subgroups of the integers under addition in this list, basically. Okay, so what that amounts to proving is that if you take an arbitrary subgroup of the group of integers under addition, that it is of this form, basically, that there is some a uh, that if you take all the integer multiples of it, is e gives you uh, your subgroup, basically. Okay, so let's try and do that. So let's suppose that I have some capital H here, which is a subgroup of the group of integers under addition. Okay, what I want to try and prove to you is that this capital H is one of these ones that I've already shown you, basically. Okay, so there are two options then. Either capital H is just the trivial subgroup that contains only zero, okay, in which case it is one of these ones, okay, it's zero z, like so, or capital H has to contain at least uh, some positive integers, basically. Okay, so there are only two options. Either H doesn't contain any positive integers, and therefore it has to be this uh, 0z subgroup here, or H does contain some positive integers, and then it's not this 0z uh, subgroup. Okay, so why can it not be the case that you have a subgroup which contains only non-positive integers, okay? So why can it not be the case that you have a subgroup H that contains zero and then a whole bunch of negative integers, but they're not positive integers? Well, how can it possibly be closed under inverses if you only have negative integers and no positive integers, okay? If you only had negative integers, then you wouldn't have their inverses, okay? And therefore, it wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't obey axiom 4, so it wouldn't be a subgroup. Okay, so, uh, basically, if H is not this trivial subgroup, which is 0z, which only consists of the 0 element, then it has to contain uh, some positive integers, basically. And therefore, it contains the smallest positive integer. Okay, so if it contains positive integers, it contains the smallest one, basically. Okay, so maybe the smallest one might be 3 or something. Okay, so it might contain 0, uh, then it might not contain 1 and 2, but it would contain 3. 3 would then be the smallest positive integer that H contains. Okay, more generally, let's call B the smallest integer, uh, sorry, smallest positive integer in H, basically. Okay, so B is an element of H, and it is the smallest positive integer. Okay, now my claim then is that capital H is actually equal to BZ. It's equal to the subgroup, which is all integer multiples of the smallest uh, positive integer B that capital H contains. Okay, so what I now need to do is prove 
prove that that is the case. So the first thing that I'm going to do is show that BZ has to be completely contained in capital H. Okay, so what I'm going to show is that this set consisting of all integer multiples of this little b here is actually contained within uh, the subset capital H of the integers, basically. Okay, so I'm going to show that all of the elements of this, which remember will be 0, b, negative b, 2b, negative 2b, etc. All of those elements have to be within capital H if b is in capital H. Okay, well this is quite simple. If b is in capital H, uh, then you have to also have 2b within capital H, because that's just b plus b. Okay, if b is in capital H, then you can compose it with itself to get 2b, okay, and because this is a subgroup, it has to be closed under composition, therefore you must have 2b also in H. And then you can go on with this argument. You can say, okay, now what I can do is I can compose b with 2b to get 3b, okay? Therefore, 3b has to be within H if H is going to be closed under composition, okay? Then I can compose 3b with b again to get 4b, and therefore I've got the argument that 4b has to be an element of H. And this can go on and on and on to show me that all positive integer multiples of b have to now be within H, okay? We know the identity is going to be within H, so I'll tick off the ones we've covered. We've covered all the positive uh, integer uh, multiples of b, okay, they all now have to be in, otherwise it's not going to be closed, okay. We know the identity is going to be in h, because all subgroups have to contain the identity, so 0 is certainly going to be there, okay, and then all of the negatives are going to have to be there if we're going to have inverses, okay, so that's why this entire um, bz set has to be within h, otherwise h cannot possibly be a subgroup, basically. Okay, so as soon as uh, any subgroup contains b, you have to contain all integer multiples of b as well. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, we've now shown then that bz is indeed a subset of capital H, basically. Okay, what I now need to show you is that capital H cannot possibly contain any other integers that are not within this set BZ. Okay, so what I want to show you is that that's it, that BZ is H, okay? And the way that I can do that is by showing that there cannot possibly exist another integer in H that is not within BZ. Okay, so the way that I'm going to do this is for a proof by contradiction. So I'm going to say, uh, let's let, uh, what should we call it? Um, let's let, um, let's just call it A maybe. Let A be an element of H which is not in BZ. So A is not an element of BZ, so it's not an integer multiple of B. It's some integer that is outside of the integer multiples of B. Okay, right. So why does this lead to a contradiction? Well, I'm going to show that this leads to a contradiction that b is the smallest positive integer in h. So I assumed that we had picked the smallest positive integer in h when we picked b. Okay, I'm going to show you that if there is an a in h uh, that is not in the integer multiples of b, then it would contradict b being the smallest positive integer in h. Okay, so how am I going to do this? Well, the most intuitive way to see this is to think of the number line, okay? So let me just show this here. So basically, uh, I don't want you to consider the entire number line. Don't consider all of the numbers in between the whole numbers, but just consider the whole numbers on the number line. So let me put these on. Okay, so let's have 0 here, let's have 1 here, negative 1 here, 2 here, negative 2 here, 3 here, negative 3 here, and I'll do it a bit more, uh, 4 here, negative 4 here, uh, 5 here, I'll take it up to 6, negative 5 here, 6 here, and negative 6 here. Okay, now, uh, let's consider what bz looks like on the integers, and we'll do the example of b is equal to 3, basically. Okay, let's just consider what 3z would look like on the number line. So it would be all integer multiples of 3, so you'd have 0, 
okay? You'd then have 3, you'd have negative 3, you'd have 6, you'd have negative 6, and you can see that it forms this beautiful sort of one-dimensional lattice, okay, uh, along the number line. Okay, and that will be true of the more general BZ, so I've just done free Z specifically to give us some intuition there, okay, so that we've got a picture to give us some intuition on the more general BZ. Okay, so more generally, BZ will form a lattice, basically, all along this one-dimensional number line, so this is supposed to represent 9 and negative 9 here. Okay, right. Now, what we're saying is that we have some A, which is an element of H, and A is obviously an integer because H is a subset of the integers, okay, which is not in BZ, so it must be one of these portions that is in between BZ, okay? So let's just say A is equal to 5, just so that, just for the sake of the picture, we're saying A is equal to 5, okay? So here is our A, it's outside of the lattice of BZ. Now, what you can always then do is you can say that A is equal to some multiple of B plus a remainder term which is positive. So what you can do is for any A which is outside of the lattice BZ, you can go to the multiple of B that is just to the left of it. So what you're going to do, whether we're talking about negative numbers or positive numbers, you will go to the multiple of B that is just to the left okay, to the left of uh, your element A, okay, you can then say that A is equal to that multiple of B, and I'll call this more generally ZB, okay, of course in this case it's 1 times 3, so B would be 3 in this case and Z would be 1, okay, but more generally I'll just call it some integer times B, okay, and this is the um, integer multiple of b that is just to the left of your um, number a, okay? And you can then say that it's zb plus some remainder term, okay, where the remainder term is a positive integer, okay, so r is a greater than zero and it's an integer, okay, and there's another condition on it, it also is less than b, it has to be less than b because if we added b onto here, we'd go up to the next integer multiple of b, we'd go up here, okay, so r has to be between 0 and b, basically, okay, so whatever a is, I can always go to the integer multiple of b that is just to the left of it, and then I can rewrite a as being equal to that integral multiple of um, b plus some remainder term where r is a positive integer uh, that is less than b, basically. Okay, excellent. Now, why does this lead to a contradiction? Well, what I can do is I can just rearrange this equation. r is therefore equal to a plus the uh, inverse of z times b. Okay, now why does that cause a contradiction? Well, what do we know? a is an element of h, okay? We also know that negative ZB has to be an element of H, because I have shown you that all integer multiples of B are in H. So that means that negative ZB has to be an element of H. Okay, so this here, this is an element of H. Okay, uh, so what does that mean? I'm composing together two members of H. Okay, and therefore R must be an element of H. If this is going to be a subgroup, which I assumed right at the start that it was, okay, it has to be true that whenever I compose two members of the subgroup together, that I get another member of the subgroup. So that implies that little r is an element of H. Now, why is that a contradiction? Because little r is a positive integer that is less than b. I assumed that there was no... Uh, in positive integer in H that was less than B, because I assumed that B was the smallest. I picked B because it was the smallest positive integer. And here now, I have arrived at the conclusion that there is a positive integer smaller than B. That's not right, okay? So that means that uh, there cannot have been an A which was in H that was outside of the integer multiples of B, basically. Okay, which means that uh, BZ has to equal the entire of H, basically. Okay, so any subgroup, basically, of the integers 
is just of the form the integer multiples of the smallest positive integer that that uh, subgroup contains, okay? So all uh, subgroups of the integers are of this form, basically, a times z, where a is some uh, non-negative integer, okay? Right, so that then is the proof that here we have listed now all the possible subgroups of the integers under addition. Okay, right. We'll have a break there, and in the next video, what I'll then do is actually uh, discuss the fact that all of these subgroups of the integers are actually isomorphic to the integers itself.